looking this morning at one of the most extraordinary individuals in the entire Bible, the prophet Elijah. Elijah, whose name literally means, my God is Yahweh. I want my name to say that too, don't you? Because that's my God. My God is Yahweh, the creator of the universe. And so Elijah, that we look at, his name literally testified to the matchless God whose name is Yahweh. And, and what an amazing individual Elijah was, not so much because of himself, but because of what God did through him. Amazing things. Several of these we will look at in this chapter this morning. We learn about Elijah that God miraculously fed him, brought him food by ravens. We'll look at that a little more closely in a moment. That God used a, a widow to provide daily bread for him for a period of time. That Elijah prayed and God raised this widow's son back from the dead. Elijah, we especially know, was involved in a showdown against the false prophets of Baal in a place called Mount Carmel and how he called fire down from heaven that gave display to the God Yahweh. And, this is kind of almost a footnote, but it's very interesting, he ran, at one point in his life, he ran 17 miles ahead of horses and chariots. Now just think about that one for a little bit. Those other things we know a lot about, they may be thinking about that. He was a marathon man, uh, and, and he was very good that he could run that fast and for that long so I'm amazed kind of just at that that point as well so those are all those stellar things about the life of Elijah but the flip side is that we find and see that he was so very very human like us there were those times when he was bold and decisive we like to focus on oh, Mount Carmel uh, he's bold and he's decisive but there, there's other times in fact shortly after that he's very very fearful and very tentative, and so exactly the opposite. There's moments when we see him very victorious, but there's other times when we see him defeated. And so here's a man who knew both the power of God, but the flip side is he also knew the depths of depression. And so what a study in contrast, but again, a very human yet an extraordinary individual. And so we can easily be wowed by the things that God did through him. Important that we understand, and James points this out in chapter 5, verse 17, a point that is so very, very important to us. It says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Sometimes in the Old Testament, people like Elijah, we kind of make them bigger than life. They're the superheroes. And we look at somebody like Elijah and say, wow, we're just amazed at somebody like this and then we're kind of brought back down to earth and, and some exciting possibilities begin to open up when James says yeah but he was a man just like us and so immediately when you think about well if he was a man like us and God did those things in his life what do you suppose he could do in our lives that's why it's exciting to take a look at this chapter today so I want us to be kind of wowed by him but let's not be over wowed by him Let's consider the possibilities. What might God do in our lives as we think about what God did through Elijah? Now, there's one key thought, one key truth, one theme, I guess, that speaks out to me, at least, in this chapter. You may read it and say, well, it didn't quite speak that way to me. I hope it does. But it's this idea of the need of the moment. And I'd like to kind of put that up and nail that on the wall of sorts and come back to that time and time again. As we read through these verses, I want you to consider about the need of the moment as we see and read these things here. So jumping into verse 1, it says, Now Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, before whom I stand, Surely there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. Now that's kind of an abrupt entrance right into a story, isn't it? Like, well, wait a minute, what's this all about? Suddenly, Elijah appeared. This is the only introduction we get to Elijah. We don't get a read detail, say, now Elijah was the, the son of you know, so and so parents. And all. We don't know a thing about his childhood. We don't know anything about it. He just suddenly appears on the scene. 
And that's the need of the moment. Because there was a great need for a prophet to show up at exactly the time that Elijah showed up. And indeed, that's exactly what it looks like here. The, the reading of this chapter, he just shows up. This man, Elijah, we're told a few details about. He shows up and he appears before the king. And we're told the king that he appeared before was a man by the name of Ahab. And we need to pause for a moment there and appreciate a little bit about who he was and the situation because some of you might be saying, I don't know who Ahab was from anybody. We need to know that this King Ahab also had a wife, a very wicked wife by the name of Jezebel, and that's a name that might ring a bell because people that are only vaguely familiar with Scripture have heard the infamous name of Jezebel. Well, Ahab and Jezebel happened to be in the leadership of the people of God, the nation of God at that time, and it wasn't a very good thing. Back up a little bit into chapter 16, verses 29 to 31. Those three verses are rather important to frame the situation before we move ahead. Now, it says that Ahab the son of Omri, became king over Israel in the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah. There were, were, were two kingdoms at that time, nation of Israel divided. Uh, and anyway, Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. Verse 30 is probably the most important. Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. And I think we'll just stop there with verse 30 because that frames it so well. So we have Elijah showing up. The prophet of God, he shows up and he has a, apparently an audience with the king. And this is no ordinary king. He's about the worst thing that had ever happened. It was a very, very dark time. It was a time when the, the people uh, were involved in open idolatry. There was great political corruption. There was great moral decay. And if we pause for a moment, you might say, huh, that might sound a little bit familiar to the times that we live in. It was not a good time. The prophet Isaiah described times like that in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20, when he said, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness. And that's exactly the way it was in those days, and that sounds a lot like the days that we live in, thus an application we're going to get to in just a little bit. So God raised up a man, a prophet by the name of Isaiah, or not Isaiah, Elijah, excuse me, raised up Elijah, and he called him to pronounce a, a specific form of judgment against the people, namely a drought, because we read in verse 1, that he is going to declare that there'll be no rain for a period of time. And so they're about to enter into a time of drought, which is so very common, a type of judgment that God pours out. Back in Deuteronomy chapter 11, some solemn words in verses 16 and 17, I believe the words of Moses to the people of Israel, when he said, Beware that your hearts are not deceived, and that you do not turn away and serve other gods and worship them. Or... The anger of the Lord will be kindled against you. He will shut up the heavens so that there will be no rain and the ground will not yield its fruit and you will perish quickly from the good land which the Lord is giving you. People of Israel knew about that. They knew if, if there was a drought, that was God's sign of judgment. That kind of rings a bell for the, those of us living in the Southwest, doesn't it? We know about drought. And there's all this scientific evidence about the drought that we're in. And sometimes I, I'm a little bit skeptical about it. I don't know. Uh, sometimes I think they're trying to prove global warming. And maybe there is such a thing as global. I don't know. I don't want to go on record either way. But some scientific research back in October of 2016, so not that long ago, stated there is strong evidence for severe long-term droughts affecting the American Southwest. A mega drought lasting decades is 99% certain to hit the region this century. I read that and I don't like that. Mega drought. We think it's dry now. It might get worse. We might be in the middle of something that's going to get really, really bad and last a long time. I don't know. And whether or not such a thing is divine judgment or merely a climate phenomenon, who's to say? But it has our attention. So we read about a drought that Elijah pronounced what happened to the people of God. So we understand that. And again, God may be bringing that about as judgment. It may be just the way that it is. 
but we understand that situation. James chapter 5, verse 17, it says, Elijah prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. So we're not really given the time duration in verse 1, but James tells us three and a half years it's not going to rain. Three and a half years. Three and a half years is kind of a significant number, especially if you study Bible prophecy. The last three and a half years of human history before the return of Christ, lots of cataclysmic kind of things go on. The book of Revelation outlines them. In fact, Revelation 11, verses 3 and 6, talks about two individuals that will show up, kind of like Elijah. They are just simply called two witnesses, and it says in verse 3, I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days, which happens to be three and a half years, same amount of time that Elijah pronounced a drought. These have the power to shut up the sky so that rain will not fall during their days of prophesying. Apparently the need of the moment before our human history is ended, before the return of Christ, the need of the moment is that God would send a couple of individuals to try to get the attention of the people. That's what the drought of Elijah was about. Not that God so much wanted to punish them, but He wanted to get their attention. Hey, you've been living in disobedience. You've forsaken me. I want you to come back. And that apparently is going to be the intent at the end of this age. God sends a couple of prophetic figures like Elijah trying to appeal to humanity saying, wake up and pay attention to me and come back to me. I want you back. Because that's what God's judgments are always about. Sometimes people think God's just this ogre that likes to, to, to mete out punishment and, and be bad to people. But God wants that none would perish, but all would come to repentance. So when God pronounces judgment, again, it's not so much about punishment. It's, please come back. Come back to me. Again, God raised up Elijah for the need of that moment. And again, we'll think about the need of the moment in our lives today in just a little bit. But let's move ahead as we go back to, to chapter 17, verses 2 to 7. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to him, to Elijah, saying, Go away from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook of Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. And it shall be that you shall drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to provide for you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and lived by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he would drink from the brook. It happened after a while that the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. Here's another one about the need of the moment. The need of the moment was Elijah had to get out of Dodge because he had had an audience with wicked King Ahab and what he had said was not popular, and Jezebel especially didn't much like the things that Elijah said. So by God's word and command, you got to get out of here. I want you to go into obscurity in the wilderness because it, I need to protect you there. You need to be protected. And I will provide for you while you're being protected. And so in a real sense, he lived there by faith because God had told him how he was going to provide for him. And he did so, as you notice here, in a very unusual way. He brought him bread and meat twice a day by ravens. You know anything about ravens? They're very unclean birds. They're vultures. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't care to be fed meat by a vulture. <laughs> that sounds like that's going to be pretty unclean, pretty bad stuff. But it's a whole thing of faith. God said it. Clearly, this is what I want you to do. You're going to drink water out of that brook twice a day. I'm going to take care of you. I'll bring you bread. Who knows who made the bread? I'm going to bring you bread, and I'll bring you meat by these unclean vultures, ravens. And so this went on for a period of time. We're not told how long it lasted. But we're told that eventually the brook dried up. And so the drought that he had pronounced by the word of the Lord affected him as well. So he was not immune to the plague that God had poured out. But for, for this period of time, however long it was, I have to believe this was about developing Elijah's character. I mean, he's an exemplary individual, but no doubt this period of time, he is literally living by faith, whether it was days, weeks, months, or, or longer. He's living by faith. God said, I will do it, and it was up to Elijah to trust him twice a day to be brought bread and meat and to have water to drink. And so God has provided for him 
no doubt again he's developing greater faith in God but there is a type of crisis that comes along namely I'm out of water and we can't last terribly long once we run out of water so the need of the moment was then for Elijah to come face to face with a certain individual a widow that we are introduced to in verses 8 and 9 so it says the word of the Lord came to him saying arise go to Zarephath which belongs to Sidon and stay there behold I have commanded a widow there to provide for you so the need of the moment once the water supply ran out in the brook is don't worry Elijah I got another plan here's where I want you to go I want to introduce you to this widow and it's interesting what is said about her we know very little about her other than God says I have commanded her to provide for you I don't think God is one to override will and choice so I think this says something about her that she's very receptive to what God said to do concerning Elijah so indeed God commanded to provide for Elijah but I believe that she had to be willing in order to do that and so the need of the moment was for this widow to to find provision in her desperate time as well as help Elijah during his verses 10 to 12 it gets even more interesting he arose and he went to Zarephath and he went and he came to the gate of the city and behold there was a widow who was gathering sticks and he called to her and said please get me a little water in a jar that I may drink and as she was going to get it he called to her and said please bring me a piece of bread in your hand but she said as the Lord your God lives I have no bread only a handful of flour in the bowl and a little oil in the jar and behold I'm gathering a few sticks that I may go in and prepare for me and my son that we may eat it and die so Elijah shows up at just the right moment she's down to her last meal and so Elijah first of all wants a little bit of water which was pretty scarce remember it was a time of drought but please get me a cup of water and oh by the way while you're at it I sure could use a piece of bread well interesting you mention that Elijah you see I'm picking up a few sticks guess what my son and I are just about ready to sit down to our last supper literally <laughs> we're gonna have one more meal I'm gonna build a fire we're gonna take that little bit of flour that little bit of oil I'm gonna take that that minuscule amount we got left we're gonna make some bread and eat it and that's it it's all over we're gonna die because of this severe drought need of the moment gets even more interesting because some faith and obedience is called for verses 13 and 14 Elijah said to her do not fear go and do as you have said but but's always a strong word uh oh here comes the the clincher but make me a little bread cake from it first and bring it out to me and afterward you may make one for yourself and for your son for thus says the Lord God of Israel the bowl of flour shall not be exhausted nor shall the jar of oil be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain on the face of the earth Wow what a challenge yeah go ahead and make that last meal but here's what I want you to do I want you to make a bit of bread for me first there's not a lot to go around anyway I would gather from the story make me a, a cake of bread first bring it to me then whatever's left you and your son eat that and oh by the way God says if you will do this hard as this might be to believe the flour and oil never gonna run out what an amazing thing so what is the widow to do do I do I take the challenge to faith here do I offer that little bit to him first or do I just keep what's left and we know it's not much but at least my son and I will have that one meal what to do what a challenge and I think that's often how God wants it God challenges us the same way I was thinking about the great tithing promise Malachi chapter 3 verse 10 many of us know it by heart but the promise and the challenge of tithing where God says bring the whole tithe the tithe simply means 10 percent bring the whole 10 percent into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house and test me now in this says the Lord of hosts if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows that's the kind of promise that Elijah is made by the word of the Lord here and that is a real challenge wow I don't have a lot of money anyway God but yet this tithing thing says if I take my first 10% like that loaf of bread 
that Elijah wanted first. If I take the first 10%, somehow the 90% is going to be more than enough. In fact, God says, I dare you. Test me in this. If you'll bring the first 10% in, I'll open the floodgates of heaven and I'll bless you beyond anything you can imagine if you'll just in faith do this one thing with the first portion. That is exactly the challenge that Elijah has brought before this widow. And again, that's kind of the precedent for how God challenges us. I think of Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. Same deal. Make the kingdom of God your first priority. Bring that first part to me, and then I'll take care of all the rest. But you've got to trust me in this. The need of the moment for us, as it was for that widow, take the step of faith. Offer ourselves, offer our resources to Him first, and then let the miracle unfold because God will do it. But we've got to have that faith first, as was the case with the widow. Let's continue on. Verses 15 and 16, it says, So she went and did according to the word of Elijah. And, and she and he and her household ate for many days. The bowl of flour was not exhausted, nor did the jar of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord which he spoke through Elijah. So far, so good. She took the step of faith. She did exactly what Elijah asked, and a miracle began to unfold. A miracle that sounds kind of similar. Sort of like Jesus feeding the multitudes with a few loaves and fishes. A similar kind of a miracle, but again, that's how God works. And so it. Sounds pretty good so far, but it's not over yet. Verses 17 and 18. Now it came about after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became sick. And his sickness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. Left at him. And so she said to Elijah, What do I have to do with you, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my iniquity to remembrance and to put my son to death. An amazing statement. She has seen the work of God through Elijah provided for about three and a half years. Well, maybe not quite that long, but uh, th that's when the, the miracle would go on for that long. She had seen for a period of time the provision of God, and then now comes the crisis and she has trouble believing. Man of God, what have you come to do? You've caused me nothing but trouble. Wait a minute, I'm surviving because you provided for me. But yet she's come to a, a crisis of faith. You know, it's one thing to see God provide in this life. But then the idea of resurrection, because that's what's at stake here. What about resurrection? What about my son? Will I ever see him again? And you know, that becomes a great challenge to faith for us. God may provide now, but what about this real leap of faith? What about resurrection? What about my, my loved ones that are sleeping the sleep of death? Will I ever see them again? The great question of all summarized by Job in chapter 14, verse 14. If a man dies, will he live again? And no doubt that's on this woman's mind. He's died apparently rather young. But indeed, that's the, the age-old question. If one dies, will they live again? Is there a miracle in resurrection? Job believed what this widow was about to find out. Job 19, verses 5 and 6 are two verses that mean so much to me. As for me, he said, I know that my Redeemer lives. And at the last, he will take his stand on the earth. And even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh, I shall see God. The resolute faith of a man named Job, who knew that resurrection was real. He knew he would live again. That God would come and literally put his feet on planet earth. And on that day, Job knew that he would eyeball God in his flesh, in a resurrection body. The need of the moment in light of the crisis here is for the greatest of all miracles. Verses 19 to 23, Elijah said to her, give me your son. And then he took him from her bosom and carried him to the upper room where he was living. And laid him down on his own bed. And he called to the Lord and he said, O oh Lord, my God, have you also brought calamity to the widow with whom I am staying by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and called to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, my God, I pray you, let this child's life return to him. The Lord heard the voice of Elijah and the life of the child returned to him and he revived and Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother and Elijah said, see, your son is alive. It's not about Elijah. It's about the name 
that Elijah would bear. My God is Yahweh. Elijah gave testimony and proof to the real God whose name is Yahweh by this amazing miracle. God performed it through him, raised the son from the dead. And again, what a powerful, powerful testimony that God could even raise the dead. I think about Hebrews 11 verse 35 that says women receive back their dead by resurrection. I have to wonder if that wasn't the key thought from this story here. The writer of Hebrews reflecting back on this amazing story. Well, the last verse. The woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. She's absolutely convinced of the God who is at work through this man of God. What a great story. But it's not a story just from the past. It is a story that has some great applications in the moment, because I want to come back to that phrase. The need of the moment is for special servants during difficult times. That's the first thing we learn. The need of the moment was the man of God needed to be raised up in the dark days of Israel's history. These are dark days that we live in. The need of the moment is for Elijah's today that God raise up men and women in the spirit and in the power of Elijah. And I believe God is doing that very thing. Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, the very closing words of the Old Testament says, Behold, I'm going to send to you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and the terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. Talked about before the coming great judgment day that God had raised up in Elijah. John the Baptist came onto the scene and they thought he was a type of of an Elijah and Jesus verified that indeed he was that he came in the spirit and the power of Elijah I believe God would raise up men and women today I think he's raising us up for that task to be Elijah's in this day and age to turn the hearts of the wicked back to God because God doesn't want anybody to perish he wants everyone to be saved so God would use us to accomplish that I believe he wants to put and has put the spirit and the life of Elijah in our lives as well the need of the moment is for faith and obedience. Will God come through or won't He? A question probably the widow asked. We know that God will come through, but sometimes we don't know, if you know what I mean. We know it in our heads, but we don't always know it in our hearts. God will come through. Yeah, I read Bible, the Bible, I know He's done it. He'll come through, but I'm not exactly sure I really, really have a grasp of that. And so the need of the moment is for faith. And for obedience, what God says to do, we do. Even though it doesn't make sense, even though it looks out like we might lose instead of win in a sense. The need of the moment is to step out in faith and to obey as God wants us to. The need of the moment, according to this story, is to know that God's provision is always adequate. It may not seem like superabundance, but God's provision will always be adequate whether in material resources, whether emotional or spiritual strength and help, what God provides will always be enough. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and his life is an example and an encouragement concerning faith, concerning prayer, and concerning the possibilities. I want to leave you with these two verses out of James 5, because this is where I think it is the most exciting of all. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the earth for three and a half years and then he prayed again and the sky poured rain and the earth produced its fruit. I would dismiss this story of Elijah to just say it's a great Bible story if it weren't for the reality check that James brings to us. His nature was like ours. A human being just like us. Imagine what God wants to do in our lives. And so I hope this story just inspires us and opens up the faith possibility to say, God, what do you want to do in my life and in our lives? Because Elijah's a prototype. And I know you want to work things in our lives as well.